All right, today we're going to talk about this period in the United States history where we're going to see the map of North America change dramatically. We're going to see it go from this to this to this to this, and most of it's going to happen between 1840 and 1850. And accompanying this dramatic change in the map is going to be this rapid westward expansion by the population of the United States. So more people are going to move to this Louisiana territory, and then more people are going to go beyond that to this place we're going to talk about, Texas, and then even beyond that, uh, California and Oregon. So why are people going to move? Why is the map of the United States going to grow essentially double in size? Well, what I learned growing up was that this thing called Manifest Destiny was responsible for American westward expansion. So Manifest Destiny, more or less, is the idea that the United States grows because Americans are destined to spread democracy, Republican government uh, across this continent. And, and in doing so, bring enlightenment to the peoples of the Western, uh, the Western areas, um, teach them the right ways of civilization. So this technology, this Republican government drives American West and sort of pushes away the backwardness of uh, westward expansion or of, of Westerners. So the term manifest destiny, this is originally going to be coined in 1845 by a newspaper writer, a guy named John O'Sullivan. Uh, John O'Sullivan says, our manifest destiny is to overspread and to possess the whole continent which Providence has given us for the development of the great experiment of liberty and federated self-government entrusted to us. The God of nature and of nations has marked it for our own, and with his blessing we will firmly maintain the incontestable rights he has given and fearlessly perform the high duties he has imposed. So in O'Sullivan's mind, Americans are going west because God told them to. God wants them to bring civilization to the west. Now, I learned this growing up, but I'm going to tell you Manifest Destiny is nonsense. At least it's nonsense as something to explain this westward expansion we're talking about. Not one person is sitting there at their newspaper, reading their newspaper in Pennsylvania, and is going to set the newspaper down and say, Hey, honey, uh, God just told me we need to move west because uh, he wants us to promote Republican government. He wants us to bring civilization to people in the west. Not one single person said that. Now, as we're going to talk about, maybe somebody will move west and they'll later say, that is what, what I did it for, but that's not going to be their actual motivation. It might be a justification, not a motivation. Uh, people are going to be moving west because they want to be happy. You know, People are going to be moving west just the same reason that you might take a job in a different you know, a different state or something like that, because you'll make more money, you'll get security, you'll get happiness, you'll make the serotonin or whatever it is, the endorphins pop in your brain by going there, finding opportunities, and doing better than you could in the East. People are going to move West because they see happiness in the West. It's going to provide opportunities they can't get in the East. They want to be happy, okay? So if you're talking about the reason why people move West, it's for happiness, opportunity, all that stuff. Now, why is it that I learned Manifest Destiny? Why is it that I learned that people move west because God told them to spread Republican government? Well, what we're going to be talking about is that as people are moving west, they're going to be displacing a lot of people that are already in the North American West, a lot of American Indians, a lot of uh, Mexicans. And then people are going to come along years later, and it doesn't make sense, you know, I pushed this guy off his land because I thought it'd make me happy. It's going to make a lot more comforting to say I pushed this guy off his land because God told me to, because I need to spread democracy. It was my responsibility. So maybe I learned it because it was a justification for what we're about to see happen. I don't know, but it's not the reason we're going to see this westward expansion. So the thing pushing people west is happiness. But that itself doesn't explain the map changes. How is the U.S. going to grow so rapidly and double in size? To talk about this, we need to get in the DeLorean, and we're going to need to go back to right around 1810. So let's go back in time, you know, from 1840 or so, go back to about 1810, 
and talk about what is happening with America's southern neighbor, New Spain. Okay, so as we've talked about in the past, the Spanish had colonized South America, good chunks of the Caribbean, and they'd colonize this whole area that's later going to be Mexico, Central America, and part of the American West. And they called this area New Spain. Well, as we talked about, after the Spanish colonized this area, they're going to subdue the indigenous population, uh, essentially keep them as second-class citizens, and use them as laborers to extract this mineral wealth that's uh, in, in New Spain, these areas like Zacatecas, San Luis Potosi, full of silver, and you have basically this sort of tier system. Well, what happens in New Spain is you're going to have this indigenous population, and the indigenous population is going to make up a significant portion of the population, uh, some 3.5 million people around 1800, 1810. Uh, they're going to be unhappy. They're not happy with their situation. Uh, you're also going to have a population of 1 million, maybe 1.5 million a uh, group of mestizos. These are mixed European and Indian inhabitants. So as Spain had been in uh, Mexico for 400 years at that point, you know, you're going to have intercouplings between Europeans and Indians. Uh, a mestizo is essentially mixed races. The mestizos mixed uh, uh, Indian and Spanish. You're also going to have a handful of Africans in there. Uh, you didn't see the Spanish bring in a lot of African slaves because they didn't really need them as laborers uh, because you had this large Indian population. And then in New Spain, you're also going to have about a million of a group we call criollos. Okay, These criollos they are European in ancestry, so they're white. So they're just like somebody that would normally come from Spain, white skin. But the thing is, they've been born in New Spain, um, born in the Americas. Well, this is going to be a big deal because the Spanish, the way they essentially set up their social, economic, political system is they don't want to give much power to these criollos. Basically, they look at people as being born in the Americas as almost lesser, and they don't want to trust them with running the colony because a lot of them think that if you put a criollo, somebody that was raised their whole life in New Spain, in charge of things, then he's going to do what's best for his home area. He's going to do what's best for New Spain. He's not going to do what's best for Spain back in Europe. That makes sense. And so it makes sense. It's also, as Criollos would certainly argue, it's also wrong. You know, these guys want to do what's what's good for their population. They don't want to do uh, necessarily what's good for uh, people back in Spain. Well, for this reason, the Spanish had been ruling New Spain and the rest of their American colonies by sending over Spaniards. And this group they're going to call Peninsulares. Uh, in New Spain, there's only 15,000 or so of these guys. But these are going to be the dudes that are governors. These are going to be the ones that are viceroys. They're going to be the ones that are in charge of everything. They're also going to be the ones that have all the money generally. So Criollos, you know, just the way the Spanish system set up, uh, they will be sort of this middle class where they're going to be businessmen, a handful of newspaper owners. There's going to be, you know, uh, merchants, stuff like that. Uh, there'll be landowners, ranchers. But they're not going to have the equivalent wealth of these guys from Spain. And this is, again, because the Spanish uh, give more opportunities, political opportunities, uh, economic opportunities. You're going to get the home country giving out land grants to people born in Spain rather than they would these Criollos. So what this system sets up is this sort of tier system. You have Indians and Mestizos at the bottom. Again, they're not going to be slaves, but essentially you're going to be relegated to the lower class. They're going to be debt peons. Um, basically, you're going to be born, say, working for uh, on somebody else's land. You're probably not going to be providing an education. Uh, for your young years, you're not working. Maybe the guy that owns the ranch or whatever you're working at maybe provides your clothing. You build up some debt. By the time you're an adult, you're already in debt to this guy because he's been paying for your clothes and food, and he's going to expect you to be paying off this debt for the rest of your life. You don't want to have an education to know, hey, I can go get another job. You owe this guy money, so you're going to be spending your life working for him. There's almost essentially there's no way out of this lower class 
uh, make your way up. And again, you have this sort of racist system that Spain sets up as well that's going to relegate you to the bottom. Um, so you have that. Then you have this Criollo middle class. Again, maybe ranchers, maybe own some land themselves, uh, maybe merchants, something like that. But while they're going to serve some local political positions, Spain back home isn't going to allow these guys to serve higher political positions like governors. You're really going to see Criollo generals just because they don't trust them to do what's in the best interest of Spain. So they're, again, same genetics as Peninsulares, but they're relegated to this middle class. And then again, Peninsulares at the top. So what you saw in Mexico, what's going to be Mexico, New Spain, throughout the 1600s and 1700s, is a lot of resentment. You had this sort of resentment based on these racial lines for people at the bottom, uh, having to work for the people at the top. Criollos, they resent pen peninsulares because they can't serve in these higher up positions. Uh, they're resentful that these guys have the best jobs. They have even more money than them. And then you have these mestizos and Indians. They basically resent all of them uh, because they see them as having more than them. So it's a lot of resentment built up. And you're going to have at certain points, 1600s, 1700s, where you have these Criollos actually contemplate rebelling against the mother country. The Criollos, you can almost think of them like you would think of most white uh, Americans in, in the United States. They, a lot of them had been reading Enlightenment literature, although less so than the United States because Spain has these uh, strict restrictions on what uh, people can read in the Americas. They ban certain books, things like that. But some of these books, you know, Voltaire, uh, uh, Adam Smith, they'd made their way to these Criollos. And a lot of these guys say, why can't we take these guys out? We should be able to govern ourselves. So you can almost think about it, again, the same way Americans are thinking about Parliament and the king. We should be the ones running things. The difference in what's happening in New Spain and what's happened in, in the United States, the British colonies, uh, is that these Criollos are concerned that if they revolt against these guys, revolt against the Peninsulares, and they revolt against Spain back at home, then it's going to open the door for these mestizos and Indians to revolt. They are going to look at what happened in Haiti and saw see how a class war turned into a race war, and they're worried that if whites start fighting other whites, then that's going to get the Indians fighting the whites. And these Criollos basically look at it and say, you know, uh, hey, we don't like these guys are at the top, but, you know, the worst case scenario would be if the Indians turned against both of us. So it's this weird situation you're going to see in uh, New Spain. And so this is going to prevent anybody from taking any action. So whereas the United States becomes independence, uh, 1776, and, you know, officially recognized in 1783, these guys keep their mouth shut, the so Criollos do, because they don't know... They don't want to set off this race war, essentially. Well, something's going to happen in 1808 that is going to push the Criollos towards revolution and push New Spain towards revolution with its home country. And this thing is going to be the ascension of Napoleon Bonaparte. And in 1808, Napoleon will take over the home country of Spain. So we've talked about Napoleon before. Uh, Napoleon took over a good chunk of Europe. He was actually allied with Spain throughout the first years of the 1800s. And Spain had actually allowed Napoleon to bring his troops into Spain uh, in order to pass through to Portugal. So uh, Portugal had been allied with the British. Napoleon doesn't like the British. And the Portuguese were bringing a lot of goods illegally into uh, Europe. And Napoleon's trying to keep British goods out of Europe. So he wants to go in, take over Portugal. So he's going to ask his buddy Spain, hey, can we go send my armies through here and take Portugal out? The king of Spain, not the smartest guy in the world, will give Napoleon the thumbs up. Napoleon comes in here, starts attacking Portugal, and his troops are all over Spain. And he looks around and says, you know what, while I'm here, why don't I just take over Spain? You know, like my troops are right here. I'll just send them. I'll take over the king. I'll put my brother Joseph Bonaparte on the throne of Spain. He will then do what's best for France, and we'll get all the good stuff of Spain uh, going back to France. So Napoleon basically turns on Spain takes it over, installs his brother, and at this point, he's controlling Spain directly. Now, what does this mean for 
New Spain? What does it mean for the people of uh, this area now that the king is gone? Now that you have this guy that everybody's going to look at and say, that's not the real king. Napoleon's brother's not the real king. Who do you listen to here? Well, the Peninsulares are basically going to try to run New Spain uh, themselves and say, we're still the boss until the king gets back in charge. You do what we say. All right, so these uh, Peninsulares are trying to run things. Well, a lot of Criollos are going to look around and and they're going to say, if there was ever a time to revolt, we should do it now. Again, the problem is you have this Indian mixed race population. They're also upset, but they're upset at both Criollos and Peninsulares. And so how do we do this? You know, if we're going to revolt and take the Peninsulares out, this is the time to do it. But we also have to prevent these Indians and Mestizos from rising up. Well, the answers to this uh, sort of conundrum is going to come in the form of this guy here, Miguel Hidalgo. Miguel Hidalgo was a Spanish priest, or is actually born in Mexico. He's a, a priest who had read tons of Enlightenment literature, all the stuff that expi- inspired George Washington, Thomas Jefferson. Hidalgo had read a lot of it, and he had come to the belief, like a lot of Criollos, um, that the uh, New Spain could do better on its own. Although I, I should point out, he is, well, let me let me just say this. He's going to declare allegiance to the king, but he basically is going to say, uh, Joseph Bonaparte is not the legitimate king, and I think we should run things independent of, of Spain for the time being. Um, as we'll talk about, he's going to say that his revolt is going to be in favor of the Spanish king, although uh, historians generally think that that's not the reality. So he's been reading this Enlightenment literature. He doesn't like the Peninsulares ruling New Spain. And so what he's going to do is try to use the Catholic Church as a unifier between the Indian and Mestizo population and the Criollo population. Again, the Criollos want to get rid of the Peninsulares. They're nervous about the Indians. Hidalgo says, I have the solution. I will use my position as a priest, and he's in this uh, small town of Dolores, and he's going to say, by... Uh, at this point, Indians are you know, uh, fairly faithful to the Catholic Church. If I prove this connector and I say, essentially, God wants you to get rid of these peninsulares and support Criollos, then we'll unify things. Now, I might be giving Hidalgo a little too much credit. Basically, he just saw the peninsulares in, in 1810 when he's going to begin his re- revolt as the true uh, problems in, in uh, New Spain. Um But what he's going to do in September, September 16th, 1810, is he's going to get on top of his church at Dolores. And you might have heard, uh, you know, uh, uh, Viva Mexico, Viva La Independencia. And he's basically going to call on the people of his town who are primarily indigenous. uh, A lot of them had been attending his church to join with Criollos and take down the Peninsular government. Now, the reason I was hesitant a second before is he's going to say, we're doing this in the name of the disposed king uh, of Spain. But uh, most people think, in, in reality, he's just doing it, and then you know later on, forget about that king. We should run ourselves. So when you see this mural, this is painted a, long, a, a lot uh, a long time later, but you'll see you got people with indigenous faces here. You have people with uh, white faces. This would be the Criollos um, uh, who are going to join them. Uh, these are going to be the Indians. And what Hidalgo is going to do is unite the Criollos and the Indians, and he's going to start marching on Spanish army positions. Now, the Spanish army in Mexico there is made up on the top of Peninsulares, but there are a lot of Criollos in the army. A lot of those guys are going to defect to Hidalgo. And we'll see Hidalgo's army uh, march from one town to the next. Well, almost immediately there's going to be a problem because when Hidalgo's army goes to Guanajuato, most of the the army under Hidalgo is going to be made of these Indians angry at these hundreds of years of mistreatment. And Hidalgo is going to unleash the Indian army on Guanajuato. Well, the Indians are going to get in there and they're going to see peninsulares with white faces and they're going to say, okay, Hidalgo tells us to get them. They'll attack them, which is what Hidalgo wanted them to do. But they'll also start attacking Criollos. Again, you know, Indians in in New Spain are upset. Racial uh, issues, you know, just kept at the bottom of this ladder. 
they just see white. They they don't see, you know, hey, this guy's from Spain, this guy's from here. They just see both these guys have more stuff than me. I've been disenfranchised for a long time. And they'll start attacking the Criollo population. Well, at this point, the Criollos are going to look around. They look at Hidalgo and they say, wait, this looks like it's turning into what happened in Haiti. This is looks like it's turning into Indian versus white. And you'll see this Criollo population, and the Criollos are the ones that have a lot of the money and the arms, uh, firearms. They're going to start removing their support from Hidalgo. Hidalgo is going to be left with this uh, Indian army, and some of the Criollos are just going to defect back to the Spaniards. And with uh, the support of the Criollos, the uh, Spaniards will be able to suppress Hidalgo's army. Hidalgo's eventually going to uh, be defeated in, in a number of battles. His Indian army will. He'll try to retreat. Um, he's actually going to try to make it to the United States, but Spanish forces will capture him uh, in northern Mexico, uh, and they're going to execute him bringing an end to this independence movement by 1811. And from 1811 to 1820, New Spain, there's no talk of independence. Napoleon's defeated. The king gets back on the throne of Spain. Uh, so everything by 1815 is back to normal. And it looks like Mexico's never going to get its independence. Until 1820, this guy named Augustine de Iturbide will come along. Iturbide was a Criollo. He was white. He was born in uh, New Spain. And he had actually fought against Hidalgo's forces in 1810. But Iturbide, uh, and he'd risen, he was one of the few Criollos that had risen to the rank of general. Generally, they don't let uh, Criollos uh, rise that high. But he was a Criollo they trusted, rises to this high rank. And he's going to realize in 1820 Maybe I fought on the wrong side, or or maybe I was wrong. Maybe we should have our independence from the king. Well, what Eater B Day is going to determine is I think I can create this link between Criollos and Indians by by getting the army to defect under me. If I have the army, I have the arms, uh, I have, and then I'll have the support of the Criollos, and then we can push the Spaniards out. And Iturbide will actually uh, meet with leaders of uh, the remaining. There's a handful of indigenous forces that are uh, continuing to fight out in the countryside. He actually meets with a rebel leader and he says, if you guys can get the Indians to support me, uh, we'll bring independence to Spain. And he's going to say, when we get uh, independence, we're going to work on equality. We're going to um, guarantee we have a Catholic government. But we're going to have equal rights under the law. Now, he's going to be very vague in this trace guarantees. It's a lot more complicated than this. But he basically portrays it as this new Mexico that we form. That's going to be the country it's going to be called. Uh, this Mexico we form will have equality of opportunity between whites and indigenous people. Well, the rebel leaders will agree to this. And in 1820, together, uh, the Indians and the Criollos will finally expel Spain. And in 1821, uh, Iturbide will march into Mexico City. He's going to capture the viceroy of uh, New Spain, force him to recognize independence. Now, it's going to take a while for the king of Spain to agree to it. But uh, uh, essentially, all Spanish forces are kicked out of Mexico at that point. And now we have independent Mexico in 1821. All right, so we talked about the United States getting its independence in uh, 1783, and then it's just this significant um, you know, rise in power from that point to um, uh, the time period we're talking about now for the United States. So you would think once Mexico gets its independence in uh, 1821 that we're going to see a similar ascendance for Mexico. That's not going to be the case because Mexico is going to have a lot more problems than the United States had in 1783. Now, as we talked about, things weren't easy for the United States in 1783. You know, uh, the British are keeping their forts in the Northwest Territory. The states are fighting one another. It, it's, you know, uh, Shays Rebellion, that type of thing. It wasn't, you know, perfect for the U.S., but it's going to be a lot bigger uh, uh, Mexico is going to have a lot bigger problems. One of these problems is that even though the viceroy of uh, New Spain had recognized Mexico as independence, independent, the king doesn't. 
So basically all the Peninsulares flee to Cuba. And what they're going to do is they're going to start outfitting these armies to periodically invade Mexico to try to take it back over. And you're going to have the Spanish Navy come over here, and they're going to start taking position right outside of Veracruz, which was the only port that uh, that was available in New Spain because the Spanish, you know, made sure all goods went to Veracruz so they could get their duties off of them, they get get their cut of whatever was sent off. So you only have one port. Well, the Spanish Navy parks right outside here. They actually capture this little island right right off of Veracruz. So no ships can can leave out of here. Basically, you can send a little bit of trade overland to the United States, a little bit uh, down south here. But any sea trade, the Spanish are going to cut it off. So whereas the United States built their um, uh, economic empire off trade, Mexico, at least for the first years of its existence, simply can't trade. So this is going to be uh, an especially big problem. Because Mexico had gone into heavy debt during uh, the War for Independence. Um, the people that were fighting on each or B.A. side uh, had borrowed a lot of money, and people are going to expect that money to be paid back. You know, American merchants had lent money here. Some uh, merchants over in Europe had lent money over uh, to these guys, and they're going to say, we want this money. Well, a lot of these guys are going to say, well, we can't pay back this money because we can't get trade out. And you add on to that that the War of Independence for Mexico was incredibly bloody and more violent and more destructive than what happened in the United States. So all these mines that had fueled um, uh, Mexico under the Spanish, a lot of them had been destroyed. Roads had been ripped up by this army or that army. So you can't get silver out to pay people back, and you can't get silver out simply because the mines have collapsed. Somebody came in and destroyed it. So your main sources of wealth are essentially gone, and you owe a lot of money. So you have this huge debt. You have um, Spanish government not letting you trade. And you're going to add on to this that even though you win independence in 1821, it doesn't mean that everybody wants to stop fighting. You're going to have some people here, you know, uh, indigenous population. Some of these guys are expecting that we're fighting for equality meaning economic equality with uh, the criollos so basically um, uh, these criollos uh, have a lot of wealth well hey, Spain's gone but I'm still poor that guy's still wealthy I'm going to continue to fight so you start seeing the countryside of, um, uh, of Mexico start being filled with bandits who um, who are upset that they you know aren't aren't in the same economic class as the criollos all right, so this is going to cause even more problems. You're going to add on to this that um, uh, that the United uh, you you're you're entering basically a free market or a market where even if you tried to industrialize, even if you got, had a guy like Alexander Hamilton to push Mexico in the right economic direction, which as we're going to see, Mexico isn't going to have somebody like Alexander Hamilton. You're going to be in a world that's very different than the one the United States had entered when it was independent, when it became independent. So when the U.S. became independent, the only real industrial power was Britain to a lesser extent, France. So the U.S. is going to be able to carve out its place there. Well, you're now going to be starting out. In addition to the other problems you have, you're also going to be having to compete price-wise, industry-wise with this neighbor that's had what a uh, 40 year head start on you uh, industry wise. So this means if you create a factory here, even if it's a great factory producing quality products, these factories up here probably better, you know, probably um, uh, have years of experience. And so if you try to s somehow get past the Spanish Navy, sell this goods to Europe, you're going to be selling against probably a better quality good that's made cheaper from the United States. So you're competing with this powerhouse that's uh, uh, to the north. And you're not even going to be able to compete with the United States agriculture-wise. Now, Mexico is going to have some places you can grow certain products that you can't grow extensively in the U.S. like sugar, but even that is going to be limited to certain areas. Uh, and other things the United States is making money on uh, agriculturally, like cotton, simply doesn't grow as well in a lot of areas of Mexico. Now, we'll talk about a couple areas where it does grow well. 
but you can't turn into an agricultural nation because uh, the United States is going to be better off the, uh, than you at that as well. Probably the biggest problem facing Mexico when it gets its independence is that it's not sure what type of government it wants. So the United States, when it had been fighting against Britain, it sort of got its independence and then went to this 13 states and they're fairly independent of one another. Then they came together and gave a little bit more power to this national government, the Constitution. But you had this disagreement between stronger central government and stronger state government uh, in the United States. The same debate is going to come up to the people putting together the Mexican government in 1821. Some people are going to say, we need to have a strong central authority. We just should essentially repeat what Spain had done uh, and have a, a king, and they're going to actually invite some European royals to become this king. But other people are going to say, no, we should have it where the states have most of the power. So Sonora, you know, it'll have its own governor. Most of the taxes will be collected in Sonora. Most of the power will be held by the governor and the state legislature. And Mexico is going to set up its what had been provinces as states. And we should have the government locally. So you have this group, and, and they're going to call this the, the Federalists, which is uh, kind of confusing because it's different than Federalists in the U.S. But uh, these Federalists who want power in the hands of the states, and you're going to have these Centralists who want the powers in the hands of a ruler centralized here in Mexico City, which um, uh, this will be the central hub. So basically replicate what Spain did uh, here in New Spain. Well, you're going to get some people that are so devoted to one side that they're willing to fight for the other side. The centralists will win out initially because Iturbide will side with them. Iturbide will basically say, um, uh, no European royal takes the offer of, of being king of Mexico. So Iturbide says, we will have a centralist government. I'm the guy that sort of orchestrated the movement for independence. And I'll name myself emperor. And he becomes Emperor Augustine I. And he's going to rule Mexico as essentially their king. So these centralists went out. But a lot of the federalists are going to sit there and say, I don't like this. Grab your gun. And they're going to be thinking about rebellion against Iturbide. Again, you had disagreements in the United States, but uh, it's not going to be to the extreme we'll see here in Mexico. So Mexico's got these problems uh, coming out of independence the United States doesn't have. But one that's maybe bigger than all of them concerns this province up here of Texas. So Texas had been part of the Spanish Empire since uh, uh, right after Robert LaSalle had come in and accidentally landed here. The Spanish had moved in, uh, started populating Texas. They set up a government. They made it its own province. But from that point forward, basically the beginning of the 1700s up till 1821, not many people had moved to Texas. As a matter of fact, uh, in 1821, uh, the, the population of Texas is probably only 2,500 uh, people that you know were Spaniards would now identify themselves as Mexican. It had been a little bit bigger before that, but the uh, war for Mexican independence had been particularly brutal in Texas. A Spanish commander had uh, suppressed a revolution here in Texas, and to teach people not to revolt against the king, he'd essentially killed or driven, drove off half the population of Texas. So it had been dramatically uh, hurt by the war. All right, so there's not a lot of people here, 2,500 people, and uh, this is going to be a problem because a, a lot of Texas, or Texas is going to have this population of, uh, and actually this 2,500 people is only in two towns. We know how big Texas is, although, you know, under um, uh, independent Mexico, it's not going to be as big, but this area here, 2,500 people for that is not a lot of people. Well, it's in part because there's other people in Texas. It's just they don't identify themselves with this new nation. Um, you're going to have uh, some people in Texas that would be these Indians with no affiliation to any European nation. So we've talked about Indians in this class a lot. We talked about Indians in the East, Cherokees, Choctaws, these agricultural Indians. Well, the population in Texas is going to be predominantly 
these hunter-gatherer Indians that are very different than the Cherokees and Choctaws. This would be the type of Indians we see in the movies, um, you know, the ones that are riding horseback, they're hunting buffalo. These groups had become incredibly powerful by 1821 because they got this horse from Europeans, and they're going to become incredibly proficient hunters. Their population is actually going to grow um, because they get so many calories in, and it's going to get so powerful that what they're going to do is uh, essentially keep these 2,500 people here in Texas in check. You can't really uh, have a population growth because if you try to make a new settlement out here, the Comanches or the Apaches are going to come in, steal all the cattle, kill anybody that tries to wander outside of town, and then your town's going to uh, wither up and you're going to basically retreat back to San Antonio or La Bahia. And, uh, and then if you try the next time, you're going to get killed by these uh, hunter-gatherer nomads that are so efficient at riding the horse that they're going to overcome any technical advantage that uh, these Mexicans have. So you have small population of Mexicans, but you have this large population of, um, of these nomadic Indians here. So what do we do? You know, we've got to get more people there, Mexico's going to say. And one of the big reasons they're going to say that is because 2,500 people here, if you look across the border in Louisiana and to a lesser extent Arkansas, there's going to be about 70,000 Americans here by 1821. People had started flooding into this region, and we talked about this before, because this area is good at growing cotton. So you'd had tons of Americans pouring in here. We had Louisiana uh, enter as a state. You know, uh, Arkansas is eventually going to come in as a state. And basically these guys are piling up here. And a lot of these guys are going to be looking across the border and their mouths are going to be watering at the idea of getting cotton land here in now independent Mexico. So Mexico is going to say to itself, Eater B Day, these politicians, if we don't get more people here, the Indians are going to keep keeping us in check. And, you know, eventually these Americans are just going to take this from us. You know, there's so many of them, there's so few of us that we've got to do something and we've got to do something quick to populate Texas or the Americans are going to take it or the Indians are going to kill us off. It's, it's basically the situation that independent Mexico has to deal with and they have to deal with it immediately uh, or, you know, or, or her no, who knows what's going to happen. Well, what can Mexico do? Well, you know, uh, they're going to explore options, trying to get people from down here to settle up there. You know, but a lot of people down here are going to look and say, you know, I don't want to deal with these Comanches and Apaches. These things are, uh, you know, these, these guys are frightening to us. And, and uh, you know, even if I get up here, what am I going to do? I'm going to raise cattle. We can't really raise cattle effectively uh, for export because the Indians will steal the cattle if you venture too far off. Well, you know, I've heard this is good for agriculture, but a lot of people that uh, here in this area um, don't have the experience with the type of agriculture that can grow in East Texas. It's simply, you know, people down here don't grow stuff like cotton that the Americans grow. So independent Mexico is going to decide to take a measure to populate Texas that they're going to later regret. But it's going to be something that they don't really have many options. They're going to actually try to get Americans to move to Texas and become Mexican. Okay, And this is going to come out of the idea, a guy named Moses Austin. He'd actually first proposed the idea to Spain. He dies, and then Mexico gets its independence. But his son, Stephen F. Austin, will decide, I'm going to go ahead and try to do this with the new Mexican government. He will go down to Mexico. He's going to meet um, with a lot of people in Texas. Uh, he actually meets with this small population of uh, Tejanos, uh, Mexican Texans. And he's going to say, I would like to bring some Americans in here, and we're going to grow cotton. I want to bring slaves in here because Stephen F. Austin, he sees the future of Texas in cotton growth, which Americans think that slaves are necessary to, uh, uh, to grow cotton. So I want to bring cotton production, slavery here to Texas. And if I come in, then these Americans will become Mexican. We'll start giving uh, allegiance to the New Mexican government. 
We'll bring our guns with us and we'll help you fight off these uh, nomads. Well, a lot of the Tejanos here are going to look at it and say, this is great. You know, we've, we've, you know, lost half our population in this recent war. The government down there has a ton of other problems. They're not going to be able to vote a lot of soldiers to us. Yeah, come in, uh, bring these Americans. And they're going to actually petition with Stephen F. Austin to allow Americans to settle in Texas. Well, the Mexican government will eventually say to Stephen F. Austin, this guy, this entrepreneur, um, yes, you have our permission to settle 300 American families, but when you come in, you have to learn Spanish, you have to become Catholic. I know a lot of you guys are Protestant. Uh, you have to um, uh, declare allegiance to Mexico. You have to, you know, we want only good people. We don't want ne'er do wells. So we want, you know, letters attesting to your good character. And you've got to bring in uh, uh, some expendable capital because we want you guys to grow the population of Texas, grow the economy of Texas. So Stephen F. Austin says, yes, we'll only bring in good people. We'll learn Spanish. We'll become Catholic. And the, the Mexican government will actually issue land to Stephen F. Austin because if you look at this, there's a lot of land in Texas. Nobody is using it. So they'll say, you come in here. We give you free land, Stephen F. Austin. You give it to Americans. Well, Stephen F. Austin is going to turn around and he's going to sell this land to very cheap to these American families. And we'll see very quickly Stephen F. Austin is going to bring in 300 American families here. And he's going to say to the Mexican government, can I have more land to do the same thing? And it's not only going to be him. Other Americans will come in and do the same thing. Hey, you're not using this land here. We promise we're going to come in. Uh, be Catholic, learn Spanish, follow your laws. And the Mexican government, yeah, we need people in here. We'll allow these guys as well. And at first, it looks like the plan is working perfectly. These Americans come in. They bring their cotton production with them. They are bringing their African slaves. They are, uh, you know, which Mexico initially, you know, are going to permit because they, they view it as necessary to grow the economy of, of Texas. And we see the Americans coming in and bringing industry, at least a little bit of industry. You know, they'll uh, start uh, um, bringing steamboats with them, that type of thing. And the economy's going to grow. And Stephen F. Austin's going to keep his promise to help the locals fight Indians. Uh, we'll see Comanches and Apaches will be driven back. Uh, and the Tejanos, they're essentially going to give thumbs up to this American population. Uh, you know, by uh, middle of 1820s, population of Texas has ri risen to 10,000. Uh, by 1830, it'll have risen to 20,000. This is going to be predominantly Americans moving in. And at first, the Americans, they're doing exactly what Stephen F. Austin says. They trying to learn Spanish. Stephen F. Austin himself learned Spanish. They start attending Catholic church. Now, some are going to, you know, only do it publicly they'll still be protestants but mexico's fine with that you're putting in the motions and again they're going to be declaring allegiance to the mexican flag so at first this looks like the the plans are working out perfectly for um stephen f austin he's making money off these americans coming in americans are getting land they can get uh cheaper than they can get in the united states by you know the 1820s most of the the good land in the united states has been bought up or you know, claimed by one group or another, but the stuff in Texas is incredibly cheap. Uh, and then Tejanos are getting uh, help with protecting against Indians and the Mexican government's getting economic growth. And these, these people seem to be uh, obeying the rules. Well, almost immediately things, problems are going to happen. Okay. Uh, one big problem is that in 1823, those federalists, the guys that want power in the States are going to get upset because um, with each or B-Day, they don't, they don't like the government he set up. And what we'll see is they will overthrow each or B-Day. They're going to expel him from Mexico, and they're going to install a federalist government over New Spain. So basically, each or B-Day had most of the power in Mexico City. Now he gets thrown out. These federalists are going to say, all right, well, now we're going to try a different government where... Co and uh, let's go with this, Guadalajara. We're going to have the governor of Guadalajara. Guadalajara. He's going to be able, one collecting most of the taxes. He's going to be making most of the rules for the people of Guadalajara. We'll still have a little bit of a central government in Mexico City, but they're going to have very little power. Well, you know, this is going to cause a little bit of chaos for colonization, 
But Stephen F. Austin's actually going to like the uh, idea of an overthrow because by the point that it happens, Americans are starting to outnumber Tejanos in Texas, and they think, you know, hey, if we become our own state, then we'll be able to make more of the decisions for Texas ourselves. Well, unfortunately for the Americans coming in, one thing that happens when these Federalists take over is they're going to write a new constitution for Mexico that will change some things. Stephen F. Austin is concerned that they're going to, uh, in writing this constitution of 1824 for Mexico, that the new government is going to ban further immigration from the United States, and he's also afraid they're going to ban slavery. In 1824, there are a lot of people from Mexico hopped up on Enlightenment literature that view slavery as wrong, uh, and we promised equality to all people when we got independence. We haven't done that yet. So Stephen F. Austin is worried about this. Well, the Constitution of 1824 does not ban further American immigration, and it doesn't ban slavery. So Stephen F. Austin is happy about that, but he's going to be upset because the uh, Mexican government basically says, all right, if we're going to go to more state power, Texas, even with these additional Americans, there's still not enough people here. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and latch it on to this state of Cohila and create the state of Cohila e Texas. So instead of Texas being essentially its own independent state, it's now a state with Cohila e Texas. Now, this is going to be a problem for the Americans because this means that uh, the people in Cohila, who's far away from here, you know, these uh, people, Spanish speakers, uh, you know, lived in the area for a long time, they're going to be the do dominant political force over here. So some of these newly arrived Americans are kind of upset about this, but they're not initially that upset because they think the people of Cohila are going to have their back on these issues. So, uh, all right, we can deal with being uh, connected to Cohila. So it's kind of upsetting uh, to them, but most of the Americans sort of overlook this. Well, and other problems will start to hit quickly in Texas. One of the big problems is going to be that some of the new arrivals that start coming in the late 1820s, they don't follow the rules like the first arrivals. And you see this a lot in just general immigration studies or something. The first people that move to an area, they sort of assimilate themselves to the major population. So when Stephen F. Austin, the first settlers, came into Texas, of course they're going to become Catholic and learn Spanish and adapt to the local customs because that's, you know, uh, you know, most of the people in Texas, uh, at, you know, when they first arrived, that's what they're doing. But if you get more Americans coming in, more Americans coming in, more Americans coming in, then they're not going to be surrounded by Tejanos and, and Mexicans. Now they're going to be surrounded by other Americans. So they're going to say, what's the point in learning Spanish? What's the point in learning Mexican customs? We're just going to act like we did in the United States. And you'll start seeing a lot of these Americans, I'm not going to Catholic church. I'm not going to learn Spanish. Some of them just, you know, I'm from the United States. I plan to be, you know, part of the United States. I don't care about this Mexican government. And as more immigrants show up, more immigrants show up, fewer and fewer are going to start obeying the laws. And actually, at one point, you'll have one uh, American who, who got a land grant from uh, Mexico. He tries to declare himself independent from Mexico. Uh, Stephen F. Austin, he's afraid he's going to mess up his money-making scheme, helps Mexican government uh, uh, get that guy out of Texas. But that indicates this problem that Americans aren't adapting to Mexico like they did at first. So this is a big problem for uh, uh, between the, the Americans and this Mexican government. Another big problem that's going to happen here in Texas is that the Mexican government will start making challenges to slavery. So in 1827, the uh, government of Cohila e Texas, again, you have the people of Cohila outnumbering the people of Texas even by 1827, the Cohelan government is going to pass a state constitution, which, again, states have the most power now. And the people of Cohila outnumber the people of Texas. And they're going to vote in place this provision in their state constitution that says slavery is legal for the time being, but we're going to start getting rid of it. Basically, they said anybody that's a slave in Texas that these Americans brought in, they'll stay a slave for life. 
but no more slaves can be brought in, and any children of slaves will be released at 14 years old. So the people of Kohila basically look at this and say, you guys are going to be fine, you'll have your slaves, but we're going to get rid of slavery because it's wrong. Well, the people of Texas, a lot of them, especially the wealthier ones, about a quarter of the population coming to Texas is going to be slave owners, and those are going to be the ones with the most power and money. They're looking at this as a challenge to uh, uh, their future. Stephen F. Austin, he wants to bring more Americans in because he wants to keep selling uh, land to them. He basically is going to say, I'm not going to be able to do that because all these uh, Southerners, they're starting to rely on slaves for um, labor. He's going to basically look at this as the end of colonization of Texas. And so there's going to be this huge disagreement between the American population and the state of Coahuila, uh, 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 Coahuila, Texas, about slavery. Uh, well, Americans will start getting around this immigration ban by signing slaves in the United States to 99-year contracts and coming over here. And, and basically, when they get here, uh, Coahuila, Texas, will say, we can't bring slaves. No, this guy's just a 99 uh, under 99 year contract forget the guy over here couldn't read and the contract they made him sign uh, he had no idea what he was signing for so they start getting doing that well the Coeli Texas government's getting a little bit nervous about that and so is the government in Mexico City and eventually you're going to get to this point where Mexico uh, tries to ban slavery outright but the Americans are simply going to say, we don't want to listen to this. And Mexico will rescind that saying, OK, well, go ahead and keep your slaves. But you have this by 1830, this fear among the Americans that Mexico is going to take their slaves. And this fear among Mexicans that these guys are starting not to follow the rules when it concerns slavery. And they're starting to outnumber us and they're not starting to to listen to us any further. Well, in 1830, Mexico will try to ban further immigration from the United States. There'll actually be a series of uh, armed disputes between uh, um, Texas and uh, people, Americans in Texas, and the Mexican uh, Mexican soldiers here. Uh, 1832, uh, you'll hear about Anuag, Velasco, uh, and it looks like, man, there might be fighting here. Well, Stephen F. Austin realizes that if there's fighting. It's going to, uh, you know, cost him money. So what he's going to try to do in uh, uh, 1834, 1833, he's going to travel to Mexico City to try to get Texas separate statehood from Coahuila. He basically say, says, I think we can come to a solution here. If we can break off Texas, by this point, Texas has grown almost to 30,000 people. So if we can make our own laws about further immigration from the United States, we can make our own laws about slavery, this will solve this problem. So we want to be our own state. We want to stay in Mexico, but we want to be our own state. Well, this is going to lead to this other problem that's going to happen between the Americans and the Mexicans. When Stephen get, F. Austin gets down to Mexico City, the government gets overthrown. So... Uh, periodically, you know, we talked about Idris Bide's overthrow by the Federalist. At another point, Centralists overthrew the Federalist. Well, in 1834, Centralists are going to, over, under a guy named Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, will once again overthrow the uh, government in Mexico City. And when Santa Ana gets in charge, he's going to listen to Stephen F. Austin. And the way he hears it is, you aren't uh, you don't want to listen to the rules of Coheli, Texas. And by the way, it doesn't even matter because now the power's down here. So I think what's happening up here is you Americans are, you know, trying to break away from Mexico, and I think you guys are up to something up there. So uh, Santa Ana will have Stephen F. Austin locked in jail in Mexico City, and people back here are going to hear the government's been overthrown once again. They've locked up Stephen F. Austin. Well, uh, again, at this point, Santa Ana is going to declare this centralist government's now in charge, uh, locks Stephen F. Austin up, and says that Texas is, uh, is not going to become a state, uh, not going to become its own state. And it doesn't matter because now the, the government in Mexico City has all the power, so who cares about states anyway? 
Well, this is going to get the people of Texas upset. Eventually, Stephen F. Austin will get released and make his way back up to Texas, and he's going to start inciting them into fear. They won't let us become a, a state. And it's not only going to be the people of Texas that will be upset, the Americans in Texas. It's going to be other people uh, on sort of the fringe New Spain upset. Uh, you'll have the Tejanos upset because they don't think that a centralist government's good. We know what's better for people here because we live locally and also people in other sort of far-flung uh, provinces New Mexico, Chihuahua, Durango Zacatecas, uh, the Yucatan will say you don't know how to run things because you are you don't live here and we're going to see a number of states in Mexico declare themselves in revolution against Santa Ana. Now the people of Texas will declare themselves in revolution against Santa Ana but all these different things, they're not initially going to be calling for independence. They're basically going to be saying, we just want a federalist government back in charge. So we want Santa Ana kicked out, and we want it with the states having more power. And Texas is going to say, we want um, we want our own statehood. So in 1835, uh, all these different states will declare themselves in revolution uh, against Santa Ana, and uh, Texas will say we're not calling for independence or anything, at least not initially. We just don't like Santa Ana being in charge, and we want federalist government. Uh, and specifically, they're going to call for a return to the Constitution of 1824, except they're going to say we want to be our own state, no longer part of Cohila e Texas. So all these states declare in revolution. Well, Santa Ana is going to start. Uh, marching his armies against these various revolutionary forces. He goes into Zacatecas. He's going to kill a significant uh, portion of the population, you know, these revolutionary leaders. And then uh, at the um, end of 1835, beginning of 1836, he's going to start marching against these revolutionaries in Texas. Again, at this point, San San Stephen F. Austin has returned home, and he and the rest of the Americans, along with the Tejanos in Texas, are going to be um, uh, thinking, you know, we're going to have to fight if Santa Ana comes up here. Well, they're going to look to this newly arrived American, this guy named Sam Houston, to fight if Santa Ana does try to come to Texas and put down uh, their, their revolution. We've got to, you know, if he chooses to come here, we don't want what happened to Zacatecas to happen to us. We don't want him executing our population. So we need an army. So the Americans are going to appoint this guy, Sam Houston. I shouldn't say just Americans. Americans and Tejanos are going to appoint this guy, Sam Houston, who is friends with the American president at this time, uh, 1835, 1836. Andrew Jackson, still president. Uh, Sam Houston had served under Jackson in the Creek War. He'd actually been the uh, second guy over uh, the wall in the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. He'd been shot probably in the crotch when he was going over. There's a, some dispute over, you know, uh, where he was shot uh, with an arrow. But um, he he'd had a political career in Tennessee, been pretty popular because he was a, a fan of Sam, Sam uh, Andrew Jackson's. But he and Andrew Jackson had a falling out because Sam Houston basically disagreed with Indian removal. Houston had moved in with the Cherokees for a time, and he thought it was unfair what, what Jackson was doing to them. Uh, but Sam Houston had a falling out in Tennessee. He was governor the, there, but he doesn't get reelected. And he decides he's going to come to Texas, uh, remake his political career there, you know, work under the new Mexican government. But uh, he gets there and he finds there's this revolt. Hey, you have some battlefield experience. Will you put together an army in case Santa Ana comes up here? Well, Sam Houston starts to do that. And he's going to say, if we do this, we're going to need to get uh, defensible positions. And so what he's going to do is he's going to send Stephen F. Austin to get recruits from the United States, offer uh, land over here to help us fight uh, in Texas. And he's going to basically say, we can't defend San Antonio or Goliad. And he's going to say, we should go ahead and abandon these places. Well, some Americans had already taken up a position in an old mission here in San Antonio, Sam Houston. Initially, he's going to say, maybe you guys should try to defend this Alamo mission. Maybe you shouldn't. But eventually, he's going to say, you guys get over here. If Santa Ana shows up, 
uh, you know, we're not going to be able to defend this thing. And we need to reform our army over here in the eastern part of Texas because this is where we're going to start getting recruits from the United States. And I think would be more effectively fight Sam Houston, or Santa Ana over here. Unfortunately for the Americans uh, here in San Antonio and, again, Tejanos, because they're going to also uh, defend the Alamo, uh, Santa Ana had already been marching up to deal with these Texas rebels, uh, and he's going to arrive outside of San Antonio in February 1836, um, and he's going to surround the uh, Alamo mission uh, with numbers vary. You know, 189 defenders, I think, is the uh, standard number. Uh, mostly Americans, a uh, handful of Tejanos like Juan Seguin. Uh, they're going to be trapped inside the Alamo. Uh, an American uh, congressman named Davy Crockett will show up in this Alamo to be defending it like Sam Houston. He, very similar career, friends with Andrew Jackson, disagreed with him about Indian uh, removal, come to Texas to remake his political career. He gets trapped here in the Alamo. Uh, and again, Sam Houston's going to say, we can't defend this, guys. Uh, but before they can retreat, uh, Santa Ana surrounds them. We're not going to talk much about the Alamo. I, I think the story is incredibly neat because this is this mission that the Spanish had built. By this point, you know, uh, it's, it's not a mission anymore. It's just a, a place, storage house, a place where the military would use to sleep. Um, but uh, the Americans there tried to defend it. Santa Ana, he probably has a force initially when he marches into Texas of uh, 5,000, uh, and he's going to surround the Alamo. Again, you know, if you're here in Texas, you probably heard unicorns came in, helped the Texans, you know, uh, uh, Pegasus or whatever, you know, fought for Texas independence, blah, blah, blah. The Alamo is cool setting, but it's not that big a deal uh, military-wise because these guys probably would have been more useful if they'd have fled east and, and uh, joined Sam Houston forming the army in the east. And another thing, sort of we get confused about this Battle of the Alamo. Uh, again, the defenders will all end up getting killed. A handful will uh, surrender, but Santa Ana is going to have them executed. But when these guys are in this Alamo, if you'll notice up here, there's a Mexican flag up there. They're still fighting for um, statehood in this Constitution of 1824. If you look at the flag over uh, the Alamo, uh, it's got the, the Mexican flag with the Constitution of 1824. They're not fighting for independence, so a lot of people confuse that. Um, they're fighting, again, because they don't like Santa Ana and the centralist government. Well, these guys get killed again. You know, they are going to take out a lot of Santa Ana's guys. That is true. Um, again, I'd maybe argue that they probably would have been more effective joining uh, Sam Houston. Some people argue that they did effectively so slow Santa Ana down. Again, there is some credit to that because this is going to allow Sam Houston to get, get east and continue to gra gather more volunteers. Um you know, but but a lot of the sort of the stuff that you hear about it is kind of just exaggerated. If you want to uh, learn more about it, I have a Texas history video series you can look at. So Santa Ana is going to take these guys out um, here at the Alamo. He's going to split up his forces. He's going to send some to this direction along the coast. He's going to go um, directly east with the idea of, of capturing Sam Houston. Well, it's at the, this point, right at the time, really, is actually like the day before uh, the Alamo was taken, although the people in the Alamo don't know. The people of Texas, these Americans, are going to determine we can't stay in Mexico any longer. And some people had come to Texas thinking we never wanted to be a part of Mexico. You will have these people um, uh, basically determine that uh, these Americans – that we should just go ahead and declare our independence from Mexico. We have too many disputes over slavery. We have too many disputes over further immigration. Even if we become a separate state, there's going to continue to be overturning in, in the Mexican government. Let's just go ahead and declare our independence. So at the beginning of March, you'll have these um, uh, Americans decide, and some Tejanos, although a lot of Tejanos say, hey, wait, we're fighting to stay a part of Mexico. We don't want to become independent. Uh, and some of them will sort of defect after they learned about it, this independence. But you have this, now we're fighting for independence instead of um, fighting to stay a part of Mexico and become a separate state. 
And so uh, beginning of, in the beginning of March, you'll have this now uh, Sam Houston and his army are fighting for independence. Well, Sam Houston continues to retreat east, and, uh, and he's going to keep running, and he's going to keep running. Uh, his men are going to uh, keep telling him, turn around and fight him. Uh, but Santa Ana far outnumbers Sam Houston, even after having split his forces. Sam Houston's going to say, no, no, we need a perfect opportunity. Well, this opportunity uh, is eventually going to come uh, when uh, Sam Houston reaches here in uh, East Texas at what's going to be the site of the Battle of San Jacinto, uh, basically on April, 20, uh, April 20th, uh, 1836. Sam Houston's forces are going to arrive at this uh, area and make camp. Santa Ana is going to follow, follow them to this camp. And he's going to make camp shortly uh, nearby with the plans at attacking them in the next couple days. Um, basically, uh, he's looking for the perfect conditions to attack them. Well, on the April 21st, uh, 1836, Sam Houston's going to decide we should attack him before he can attack us, before he gets these reinforcements. And for a lot of crazy reasons, uh, basically, you know, some people say it's because the Mexican army happened to be napping at the time there's the famous story about the yellow rose of texas where supposedly santa uh, anna was uh you know in bed with a prostitute who knows what the truth is i don't uh know if uh, anybody knows but uh they're gonna get caught off guard and uh the uh, sam houston's forces will rush the mexican camp catch them off guard and they're going to start killing them, uh, the Mexican forces, saying, uh, remember the Alamo, you know, because the Santa, Santa Ana had left uh, none of the defenders alive. And they'll kill a, a significant portion of the Mexican forces. Some of uh, the Mexican forces caught off guard will try to retreat through these swamps. Uh, again, you're, you're not going to go very fast if you're running through a swamp. Um, the American Texans will, will take them out. Uh, as well, uh, and they're going to kill, I don't have the exact numbers, I believe it's about 800 of um, uh, Santa Ana's, uh, 700 of Santa Ana's um, 1,350 men, uh, and then San, Sam Houston had about 900 men. Uh, I only believe, uh, again, I don't have the numbers here, I think it's only like um, like 10 or something. Actually, I do have the numbers, so 630 Mexican soldiers killed, 730 captured. The The Texans only lost eight men. And the battle's basically over in the course of a couple minutes. Well, after this Battle of San Jacinto, uh, is what, what this is going to be called, Sam Houston will meet with, uh, here's a depiction of the Battle of San Jacinto, sort of a stylized version of it. Um, here's another depiction um, Santa Ana, he's going to try to escape uh, by dressing as a common soldier. He throws off his general gear. And by the way, it's kind of crazy. I don't know if anybody was thinking about this as I'm talking, but Santa Ana is the president of Mexico. Why would you march yourself to Texas? Why wouldn't you just leave it up to a general? I mean, if you ever watch Independence Day, the president's flying against the aliens. That's ridiculous. Um, but Santa Ana, the way he ruled Mexico was basically, I'm a general, this is my job as a general to do this type of thing. And so part of the reason he did it was, um, you know, because he thought he would earn glory for himself and it would help legitimize his position as president. Instead, it means the ruler of your nation is now captured by the enemy. So Santa Ana tries to dress as a regular soldier. Somebody recognizes him. They're going to bring him before Sam Houston. At this point, Sam Houston, he had suffered a, a leg injury during the battle. Now Sam Houston's going to meet with Santa Ana. Some people are calling on uh, uh, Houston to execute uh, Santa Ana. Sam Houston says, no, that's ridiculous. We need this guy politically. He's going to force Santa Ana instead to sign a treaty, or actually this uh, two treaties of Velasco. And what the treaties of Velasco will say is that Texas is now independent. And not only independent, but it's independent all the way to the Rio Grande River. Now, under Spain and independent Mexico, Texas has always been this area up to the Nueces River. But Sam Houston wants a buffer zone uh, to this now independent Texas. So he's going to force Santa Ana to sign Texas up to the uh, Rio Grande. So they have sort of this buffer zone with Mexico. Santa Ana, you don't really have much of a choice in saying no with this um, because you're a prisoner. 
And uh, Sam Houston is going to make uh, Santa Ana sign a, another treaty basically saying you're going to go out there and you're going to tell other nations that Texas is independent. So go to the president of the United States, say uh, Texas is independent. This treaty is legitimate. Go to Britain, uh, their parliament, tell them the same thing. King of France, tell them the same thing. Uh, uh, tell them that Texas is now independent. And Sam Santa Ana will agree with that. And then, you know, to the chagrin of a lot of Texans, Sam Houston will let Santa Ana go. He'll basically send him to meet with, uh, at this time, Andrew Jackson uh, is still the president of, of the United States. Go meet with him. Tell him uh, we're independent. Well, as we're going to see, Santa Ana is going to get back to Mexico and say, I signed it under duress. They're not independent. We need to go back and get them. Uh, but at least uh, Sam Houston has on paper that Texas is to this area. So now Texas is independent. You have this Republic of Texas. Instead of being a state within Mexico, uh, you're now uh, a, an independent republic. Again, uh, as we're going to see, Mexico doesn't recognize you as independent, but you did fight off their army, uh, and, and uh, the rest of the army of, of uh, Mexico has retreated back here, and Mexico is going to be in more chaos again because you know their president was going to be captured for a while. So now you're independent. Well, got to form a government, got to answer a lot of other questions. But even before doing all that, the people of Texas are going to call a vote. And one of the things that they're going to vote on is, what do we do now? Well, if you grew up in Texas, you probably heard when the Republic of Texas formed, we said, we're going to be our own nation, damn it. That's not what they said. One of the issues they're going to vote on is, should we stay independent or should we join the United States? Well, this vote is going to be held in uh, and uh, voting throughout the, the area um, of the people that uh, voted to stay. It's going to be a vote of um, 3,277 will say, let's join the United States now. Only 91 want to remain independent of the United States. So 97% of the people in Texas, once they got their independence, said immediately, please join us to the United States. We want to be a part of the United States. The handful that didn't are probably, you know, these Tejanos down here that didn't want to be independent anyway. They just wanted to fight Santa Ana, and they certainly don't want to be a part of the United States. But uh, uh, but everybody else who'd come in basically looks and says, we would rather be a part of the United States than independent. Why? Why would they? Why would you have 97% of people wanting to immediately become part of the United States? Well, a lot of it is people are in debt. You know, they, they uh, realize that if you join part of the United States, the land you have, you can sell it to people, Americans. They'll, they'll buy it up for much cheaper. The United States uh, can protect you from Mexico better. It can protect you from these various Indian groups that are continuing to attack. Uh, and you get this U.S. Army in there, it's going to be able to defend you much more effectively than, uh, than you could defend yourselves. So basically, you just put together this ramshackle army, but if the U.S. comes in, you can have a professional army come in to defend you against Mexico, defend you against these various Indian groups. Uh, probably a more uh, sensible reason is that um, a lot of these guys, just they're American. They grew up here. They're used to the United States. They moved over here, and we just want to be in the country of our birth, you know, so uh, you have that uh, going with you. Um, and again, the, the big thing, though, is probably uh, stability, um, somebody to protect you against uh, Mexico and these various Indians. So immediately after this vote, uh, Texas, um, Sam Houston is going to become uh, president uh, of the Republic of Texas. He's going to one of his first orders of business is going to appeal to Jackson to say, Please, please, please let us into the United States. We need help. We need protection. Also, by the way, we built up a huge amount of debt fighting Mexico. Please, please, please let us in. Uh, and Jackson will tell him, hold off a second. I want to wait till this election. My, my buddy Van, Martin Van Buren's running for uh, president in 1836. But the second Van Buren gets in office, Sam Houston will say the same thing. Please let us in the U.S. Well, Van Buren will go before 
the Senate because now you are oh, one thing Sam uh, Andrew Jackson does do is he will recognize Texas as independent. He spoke with Santa Ana. He recognizes the Treaty of Alaska as legitimate. And he's going to say, you guys are independent. I'll leave it to Van Buren uh, to decide on annexation. Van Buren brings the idea before uh, the Senate. Now you have a foreign nation that the United States is recognized as a foreign nation. That means you need two-thirds of the Senate to agree to a treaty with the new nation to bring it on. Before Van Buren can even bring the subject up, he's going to realize this isn't going to happen. Where There's no way we're going to get two-thirds of the Senate. Part of this reason is because it's at this time the Whigs are hating on Jackson. They're not going to do anything they think that Jackson would like, and they think Jackson would like uh, you know, Van Buren to be presiding over the annexation of a lot of new territory. They A lot of people say, no, this they don't agree to it for moral reasons. Some people are going to look at it and say, well, these people came into Texas. They stole it from Mexico. Mexico invited them. Uh, they didn't listen to the rules. And eventually they broke away from it. Uh, some people are going to basically say, we don't want it because we don't want war with Mexico. All right. So you had these this Texas revolution where they defended Texas from Mexico. But if you want to get Mexico to recognize Texas annexation, you probably are going to have to invade Mexico as the United States. That's going to be more difficult than just defending uh, Texas. Uh, 1837, when the idea is going up, the panic of 1837 is going on. The economy is doing terrible. Some people say we need to focus on that. But probably the big thing that is going to prevent the United States from annexing Texas is that a lot of people are going to say, if we get all this area in to the United States, this is a lot more area for slavery. We just had this Missouri Compromise, you know, say that any land below this is going to be slave territory. Well, who knows how many states are going to create out of Texas. We've been keeping the balance now. If this comes in, this brings the slavery issue to the table once again. And a lot of people just sort of want to uh, shove the slavery issue under the rug. They don't want to deal with it. This would bring it to the forefront yet again, and not a lot of people are willing to do that. So in 1837, Martin Van Buren doesn't even bring the idea to the Senate because he realizes he's not going to get two-thirds of a vote. This is going to leave Texas on its own. And what we're going to talk about next time is how Texas is going to go from being rejected by the United States to eventually joining it and how this is going to cause a second war. This one's going to be between the United States and Mexico, uh, uh, this, this Mexican-American uh, war, U.S.-Mexico war. We'll talk about that next time.